friends, we'll resume our session and Mr. Peter Khan is going to speak about doubling the countries enrolled in the banners of Baha'u'llah and mass conversion. Mr. Peter Khan is the Vice Chairman of NSA of Australia and he was a member of NSA for the past five years. Beloved friends, we who have the privilege of being gathered here today are, as many speakers have pointed out, celebrating the day of victory. We have arrived at the fulfillment of the prophecy of Daniel. We have arrived at that day for which our hearts have yearned for which we have raised our voices in prayer, for which we have sacrificed our energies and our resources, and for which we have shed our tears. It is appropriate, therefore, that at this time, at this stage in the development of our faith, that we pause and take stock of our position, that we review and examine the stage which we have reached, that we compare it with the development of the religions of the past and see in what way it is similar and in what important ways it is different. It is appropriate also that we at this time ponder the sacred writings which foreshadow the new stage of development into which we are now entering. It is important that we do these things, that we review our present position, that we look at the writings which bear on the future stage of development, so that we may learn to what goals we should aim in the future development of our faith and most important of all, that we should learn what dangers, what pitfalls we should recognize and endeavor to avoid. And this, after all, is the purpose and the use of history. Not only is it of interest to us to know what has occurred, but we learn by it. It is our guide for the future. Firstly then, what are the main distinguishing features of the present stage of the development of our faith? This is a universal religion destined to embrace the entire human race. And we find ourselves at this time at the end of the first stage of a development more rapid and more diverse than that of any religion at any time in the past of the Adamic cycle. It is true that the early years of Christianity and the early years in particular of Islam were distinguished by very rapid progress and expansion. Yet it is also true that no religion has found itself at the end of its first hundred years with communities in all parts of the world and including within its fold almost every race and every group of people on the surface of this planet. Coupled with this enormous, this incredible, this wonderful diversity of the Baha'i community are the facts that within our community we recognize, we regard, we treasure men and women as being of equal status and that it is an important part of our administration, it is an important part of our consultation that all have equal say, that equal weight is given to all Baha'i voices, be they young, be they old, be they new believer, be they veteran in the cause. When we compare the progress and development of this faith with the development of the religions of the past, we see there is one further very great 
and very important difference. And that difference is that in our administration, in the workings of our faith, there is no priesthood. That there is no priesthood in our faith means that there is a much greater responsibility upon the individual to have regard to his spiritual development, to learn about his faith, to take a greater responsibility upon himself. This contrasts with previous religions where the rise of a priesthood has tended to eventually encourage a more passive attitude on the part of the rank and file of the believers and a situation where they passed part or most or all of their spiritual responsibility upon the shoulders of the priests. So the main distinguishing features of the progress and the present stage of the development of our faith lie in the great diversity and rapid growth of our worldwide community and lie in the far greater emphasis which is placed upon each and every member forming an active part of his community. In a moment, in the latter part of my talk, I want to consider what are the implications of these facts, what are the implications of the great diversity in our community, what are the implications of the fact that the administration calls for activity on the part of every individual. But for the present, I wish now to consider briefly those passages of the Holy Writings which refer to the future development of the faith, which refer to the new stage which we are now entering. It is true that the past history of our faith shows us that we can never be sure what the future holds in store for us because God's ways are mysterious and they are far beyond the human ken and the finiteness of our minds. Nevertheless, we can, by turning to several passages in the Holy Writings, see some glimmer of what the future holds in store for us. Firstly, it is probable that the next few years will witness great social and great political change in the world. The beloved Guardian, in a message of 4th of May 1953, referred to two great processes occurring simultaneously in the world. The first of these was the unrolling, the fulfilment of the tablets of the divine plan with which we are very much and very greatly concerned, with which our world crusade has been intimately bound up. And the second process to which the Guardian referred was the process of breaking down of the old world order, the process of the spirit of Baha'u'llah moving through the institutions of the outside world, fashioning them, changing them, breaking down and rebuilding them so that they may become receptive to the faith of Baha'u'llah. This second process, the Guardian told us, and to quote his words, this second process would lead, through a series of victories and reverses, to the political unification of the Eastern and Western hemispheres, to the emergence of a world government and the establishment of the lesser peace. So, we see two processes in the world. Our work, fulfilling the, the requirements of the tablets of the divine plan, and God's plan, the breaking down of old institutions and raising up of new. And the important thing which we should note is that the Guardian has told us that the two processes are related, that one affects the other. The Guardian has said that these two processes are related since to the acceleration of the second process, this present crusade, which we have now completed, will, by virtue of the dynamic forces it will release and its wide repercussions 
over the entire surface of the globe contribute effectually. Secondly, as we look to the future, we can see, as many distinguished speakers have pointed out, both yesterday and this morning, we can see that we are entering the stage wherein mass conversion will be extended over many, many more parts of the planet, bringing its life-giving power to the hearts of more and more of the peoples of the world. And we can be sure that this too will upset and disturb the equilibrium of the world. Thirdly, in considering what the future holds in store for us, in considering what we should do to bring it about, it seems to me that the immediate future must see a great proclamation of the faith, particularly through the publicity media of the Western world. We have seen the beginnings of that publicity in the publicity which the houses of worship have attracted. We have seen it in the manner in which the world's attention has been drawn to the unfortunate plight of our Moroccan Baha'i brothers. And we have seen it in the increasing attention being paid to the faith by the leaders of public thought in the West. The words of the beloved guardian addressed to the American believers in March 1945 are as vitally relevant to us today as they were 18 years ago. And this, it seems to me, is part of the great power part of the great inspiration of our beloved guardian, that his words, his interpretations, his guidance was eternal. Since the passing of the guardian, as we have turned and looked again to the writings which he gave us over the years since 1921, we realize more and more how they are continually acquiring fresh meaning for us and fresh relevance as the faith progresses through new stages. At that time, the Guardian wrote on the proclamation of the faith, and he said, Above all, the healing message of Baha'u'llah must, through the instrumentality of an already functioning administrative order, be vividly, systematically brought to the attention of the masses in their hour of grief, misery, and confusion. A more audacious assertion of the challenging verities of the faith. A more convincing presentation of its distinguishing truth. A fuller exposition of the character, the aims and achievements of its rising administrative system as a nucleus and pattern of its future world embracing order. A more direct and intimate contact and association with the leaders of public thought whose activities and aims are akin to the teachings of Baha'u'llah. A closer scrutiny of the ways and means whereby its claims can be vindicated, its defamers and detractors silenced, and its institutions safeguarded. A more determined effort to exploit to the fullest extent possible the talents and abilities of the rank and file of the believers. These stand out as the paramount tasks summoning to a challenge during these years of transition and turmoil the entire body of the believers. The facilities which the radio and the press furnish must be utilized to a degree unprecedented in Baha'i history. The combined resources of the Baha'i community must be harnessed for the effectual promotion of these meritorious purposes. Beloved Guardian, in this passage, went on to say, There is no time to lose. The hour is ripe for the proclamation without fear, without reserve, 
without hesitation, on a scale never as yet undertaken, of the one message that can alone extricate humanity from the morass into which it is steadily sinking, and from which they who claim to be the followers of the most great name can and will eventually rescue it. The sooner they who labour for the recognition and triumph of his faith, the sooner they arise to carry out these inescapable duties, the sooner will the hopes, the aims, the objectives of Abdul Baha, as enshrined in his own plan, be translated from the realm of vision to the plane of actuality and manifest the full force of the potentialities with which they have been endued. Continuing our examination of what seem to be the features of the future progress of our faith, it seems to me that it is inevitable that the extension of the affairs of the faith will result in a far greater number of attacks on the faith from the religious leaders of mankind. The religious leaders whose stars have darkened and fallen from the heaven with the rising of the sun of Baha'u'llah. At this point, at this stage in the development of our history, we proudly bear the scars of battle which we have earned in Persia, in Morocco and in other countries of the world during the past ten years where the faith has been attacked by the leaders of religion. We await with great confidence, with very great faith, we await that surely not too distant time when the Christian world, Protestant and Catholic, perhaps alarmed by our tumultuous successes in Africa and Latin America, will arise in active opposition against us and will thus, as Abdu'l-Baha has told us, will thus signalize the dawning of the hour of victory. <laughs> In December 1938, the beloved Guardian, writing to the believers of America, in his magnificent letter entitled Advent of Divine Justice referred them to the goals of the seven-year plan upon which they were then embarked. In one passage in that letter he spoke of the fulfilment of that seven-year plan and he went on to speak of the intercontinental mission upon which the believers of America and of the rest of the world would embark. This mission we know as the World Crusade. And the Guardian in that passage referred to the glories of that intercontinental mission and he referred to the great services which the believers would, would render in fulfilling that World Crusade. The Guardian referred to the World Crusade in that passage as a colossal task and he went on to speak briefly of what the future held after the fulfilment of that colossal task, the World Crusade. And it is this passage which I wish to read to you. The beloved Guardian said, and this I believe refers to the present age we are entering, he said, and who knows but that when this colossal task has been accomplished a greater, a still more superb mission incomparable in its splendor foreordained for them by Baha'u'llah may not be thrust upon them. The glories of such a mission are of such dazzling splendor the circumstances attending it so remote the contemporary events with the culmination of which it is so closely knit are in such a stage of flux 
that it would be premature to attempt at the present time any accurate delineation of its features. Suffice it to say that out of the turmoil and tribulations of these latter years, opportunities undreamt of will be born. Circumstances unpredictable will be created that will enable, nay impel, the victorious prosecutors of Abdul Baha's plan to add through the part they will play in the unrolling of the new world order fresh laurels to the crown of their servitude to the threshold of Baha'u'llah. So we have seen the present stage in the development of our faith is distinguished by the great rapidity of our expansion, by the great diversity of our community. We have seen that the immediate future of our faith gives promise of greater mass conversion, exhorts us to the use of publicity and proclamation of the faith. The future seems to have in store for us great social and political change and that in the future the darkened stars of the religious leaders will arise against us. What are the lessons which we may draw from this? What guidance does it offer us for the future formulation of our plans, personal and community? What dangers do we see to be avoided? Where are the pitfalls and how may we avoid them? It seems to me the basic lesson which we must continually remember, which we can afford never ever to forget, never ever to lose sight of. And the basic lesson is this, that this is a truly universal religion designed and destined to be embraced by the whole of mankind. Great as have been the victories of the past ten years, they are but the forerunners of the dazzling victories coming toward us in the future. We can and we will attain to these great victories if we continually bear in mind and if we continually remind ourselves that this is a universal religion. This means that we must not look upon this faith as being an Australian religion, a Persian religion, an American religion, an African religion, but we must look upon it as a world religion. We must not look upon it as being a faith mainly for the coloured man or a faith mainly for the white man, but look upon it as a faith for all men. We must not look upon it as a faith mainly for the illiterate people of the world or a faith mainly for the literate people of the world, but as a faith for all the peoples. We must continually seek the middle path and avoid extremes. We must recognize that every person on this earth is equally welcome to enter this faith. No matter who he is, no matter where he lives, no matter what color he is, what his background, what his training, what his age, that every person on this earth is equally welcome to enter the faith. We must remember that the people of the mass conversion areas entering the faith are no less welcome than the people of the western areas entering the faith and they are no more welcome, but all are equally welcome. The universality of our faith also means 
that we must demonstrate this universality, demonstrate its power by aiming on a world scale to make our community a cross-section of mankind. Just as the human body needs all parts in correct proportion so that it may function properly, so do we as a world community of Baha'is need people of all races and we need people of all social backgrounds that we may function properly. We need people who have attained a high degree of spiritual development. We need people who have attained a very high degree of faith and spiritual perception. But we also need trained administrators. We also need great scholars that this faith may continue to progress and expand. To build the new world order of Baha'u'llah, we need all classes of people. We need all backgrounds. And this we must continually bear in mind in the formulation of our personal and community teaching plans. The implications of these lessons, the need to bear in mind that it is a universal faith, the need for a cross-section of humanity, the implications of these lessons are endless. Because this talk cannot be endless, I can refer only to a few of these implications. The first to which I wish to refer is that it seems that with communities all over the world, in all stages of development, we must uh, adjust our aim of what we expect from each community to the condition of that community. In other words, we must consider that there are differences in the Baha'i world, that in some areas the soil is more fertile than other areas. In some areas, the people entering the faith are coming from a background where they are used to administrative procedures and practices and in other areas they are coming from a background where they are not. We must bear these facts in mind as we formulate our plans. One aspect of the great genius of our beloved guardian was that he was like a loving and wise father towards each of the national communities which were as his children. He looked upon them as individuals, each in its own stage of development, and he nurtured each one accordingly. We should strive to follow the example of our guardian, even more so nowadays where our community has become even more di diverse than it was at the time of our guardian. It means that we must adjust our goals to the condition, the background, the nature of the people in each national community. In some parts of the world we are struggling to remove the fetters on the emancipation of women. In some parts of the world the people entering our faith are mainly illiterate. In some parts of the world they are mainly literate. In each case the goal is exactly and precisely the same but the rate of progress and the method of progress is different in each case. It is, as it were, like bringing up children. Each one is different, each one is a different age, each one has different talents and capabilities and different training and the loving father bears in mind these differences and nurtures each child accordingly. Secondly, in looking at the implications for the future, it seems that the faith must be kept simple and its procedures flexible. We must be forever on our guard against unconsciously or unwittingly adding our own ideas 
to the revelation. Obviously none of us would ever dare or dream to do this on purpose or intentionally, yet we must be continually on our guard lest we do this unconsciously, unwittingly or accidentally. Because if we fall into this danger, our beloved faith would become not a universal religion, but a national or a local religion, and it would fall into those errors which beset and dim the luster of Christianity as it divided into Western and Eastern Christendom, of Islam as it divided into a series of groups of people in Baghdad, in Spain, in North Africa and in Arabia. We must think about and understand our administration and realize that it is not a set of procedures and rules, but it is a dynamic, a growing, a changing and flexible instrument. And we must realize that our administration is quite indispensable for the effective propagation of the faith. As has been pointed out in the last few days, let us look at the example of the beloved guardian, how he trained us in the administration for 16 years, from 1921 to 1937, before we embarked upon the fulfillment of the tablets of the divine plan. And the lesson in that is that the administration is necessary, is indispensable. The proper functioning of the administration is needed for the future expansion and continuing development of our faith. We must also think and understand that what is universal and basic in our faith and aim to present that to the people. We have many beautiful teachings on economics, on science, but our faith is not an economic system. It is not a scientific system. It is a world religion. And in our teaching the faith, we must continually remember and bear in mind that the centre of our faith is the acceptance and recognition of Baha'u'llah as a manifestation of God. In conclusion, I should like to read a few words which to me seem to be among the most beautiful words ever written in the English language. And these are words taken from the message of the hands of the cause to the conference held in Frankfurt in 1958 and it is with these words that I conclude. The work of Baha'u'llah lies before us to be completed. No one generation will do this. A thousand years at least are required to carry out and mature the specific provisions of his dispensation. But to each man his opportunity to each generation its tasks. Great moments in history require great deeds. Great men are not necessarily those best qualified to be great, but rather those who see their chance and seize it with love and courage when it offers itself. The records of our faith show that its heroes and heroines its saints and martyrs sprang mostly from the rank and file. But what they possessed, which raised them to the summits of fame and glory, were vision and faith.